Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Newberry. I'm Liam Markey, the director of the Center for Renaissance Studies here at the Newberry. And before I introduce you to our speaker today, Neil Atkinson, I just wish to explain a bit about this lecture series and thank my colleagues and friends who've made this event possible. This lecture forms part of a series of talks in conjunction with the Minneapolis Institute of Arts exhibition, Botticelli's Florence, which is on view until January 8th. I recommend everybody goes. Uh, the exhibition explores the context of Botticelli's artistic production through secular and religious painting, drawings, prints, and sculpture from the Quattrocento Florence or 15th century Florence. And so this lecture series of four talks aims to prepare the visitor for their experience in Minneapolis. We have the catalog out here too, if you wanna check it out. And it also allows us to uh, experience Florence as an armchair traveler today. I have a few slides from the exhibition because I was lucky enough to go there last week. Incredible loans from the Uffizi. So I just also wanted to note that there are two more lectures in this series upcoming. Please join us online on Tuesday, November 22nd to learn about Filipino Lippi at 3 p.m. with Jonathan Nelson. So this is the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, 3 p.m online. And then December 6th at the Italian Cultural Center will be um, Jamie Gabarelli talking about drawings and prints in Botticelli's Florence. And he works at the Art Institute and will be showing materials from the Art Institute as well. So tonight's lecture marks a collaboration between the Italian Cultural Center in Chicago and the Newberry Library. And I wish to thank Luca Di Vito and Fabiola Tosi for all of their hard work to conceive of and organize this series. And this talk tonight at the Newberry is also co-sponsored by the Chicago Map Society. And I wish to thank Jim Ackerman, Bob Holland, and Salma Ganeity for all of their help and assistance. And a big thank you for the drinks and the food uh, from Map Society as well. And I'm gonna call Jim up now for a few brief announcements. Now some slight height difference between Leah and me. <clears throat> so I am Jim Ackerman. I am the current president of the Chicago Map Society and also the outgoing uh, curator of maps and director of the Smith Center for the History of Cartography. And I just wanted to introduce, especially for Map Society members who are here tonight, introduce Dave Weimer, who's standing in the back waving his hand, doing his royal wave. That's, he's the incoming curator of maps and director of the Smith Center. And also for our Map Society members, although other people are welcome to attend, uh, we, our next meeting will be December 8th, that's a Thursday. And it is going to be our annual members night as well as our annual business meeting. I guess the idea is to get everybody well lubricated before you conduct business. Um, but the members night is when we um, ask each, uh, each member who wishes to present something from their own personal collection or something else that they are of interest and members can contact me. You know where to reach me at least until December 1st about uh, whether you wanna participate in that. So uh, thank you also to Bob Holland who really did all the work on the food today. So you can, yes. <laughs> I'll turn it back over to Leah. Thanks, Jim. We're gonna miss you, but we're happy. You're gonna still be active here at the Newberry and welcome Dave. Okay, so now on to the main event. It's my honor to introduce you to Neil Atkinson, who's the chair of the Department of Art History and associate professor at the University of Chicago. His teaching and scholarship focuses on public space, urban history, soundscapes, geography and travel, as well as the architecture and urbanism of late medieval and Renaissance Italy. His research has concerned the relationship between sound, space, and architecture and their role in the construction of pre-modern urban societies. 
Neil has won fellowships and or grants from the University of Edinburgh, Harvard's Villa Itati, the New Bauer Collegium for Culture and Society at the University of Chicago, and the Crest Foundation. His publications include a wonderful monograph, uh, which we also have on display here, uh, entitled The Noisy Renaissance, Sound, Architecture, and Florentine Urban Life, and it's now out in paperback as well. He's also published numerous articles, too many to name here. My favorite from 2016 is entitled Getting Lost in the Renaissance. Finally, Neil received a major award from the American Institute of Architects for his creative and curatorial work representing Chicago in 2018 as one of the curators of the U.S. Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale. His current projects explore digital visualizations of early modern urban soundscapes through GIS technology, as well as the visual and sonic cultures of the Indian Ocean. He's also currently collaborating on a new book project that is tentatively titled Wandering in Rome, French Travelers and the Image of the Early Modern City, which investigates the aesthetics and the mechanics of urban mobility that constituted the experience and representation of Rome for early modern French travelers. So tonight we'll learn more about Neil's continued research and writing on the urban fabric of Florence in the early Renaissance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dia. Um, and thank you also to the Center for, um, for Renaissance Studies. Thank you to Jim Ackerman and, and the Chicago Map Society. You can't hear me? She can hear me. You, the audience can't hear, the live audience can't hear me? Yeah. Oh wait, there we go. Seems to be flashed. I'm not sure what's flashing. Um, let's see here, what this speaker can respond to. Oh, it's all set up here. You want me to speak into the, uh, this microphone? How's that? Is, that? is that better? Okay, sorry about that. Um, I was just thanking everybody um, when you couldn't hear me <laughs> to Leah and to uh, Leah Markey, to Jim Ackerman. The Center for Renaissance Studies and to the Chicago Map Society, to the Italian Cultural Institute and Luca Di Vito um, and Fabio Latosi. Thank you, all of you. This is a really wonderful um, honor for me. I'm really, really happy to be here. You can't imagine how happy I am. Um, and so thank you all for coming. What I wanted to do um, I'm just is talk to you. Hang on a second. There we go. There we go. Um, uh, three, two short sections and a long section to my favorite. I just want to introduce Florence, which you see um, in a 16th century um, uh, bird's eye view here in three different ways. One as a kind of an ideal entity um, out of which images like this um, have been derived. And then to talk about the, the digital project that, um, that I'm working on with a colleague of mine at University of Chicago to, um, to build a demographic map of the city in the 15th century, in the time of Botticelli, and then to, um, to illustrate socio-spatial relationships in the 15th century through a couple of stories um, about uh, Florentines and the relationship to the city. So let's begin with, um, begin with this image here. Um, anyone who's worked on Florence has come across this image. It's, um, it's a portrait of the city from the 14th century. Um, that sits on a, it's a fresco on a wall of the confraternity of the Bigallo um, 
in Florence. And it's a remarkable image because, um, as you can see uh, here, it's, it's, so it's, it's, a, it's a mass of sort of huddled buildings surrounded right by the city walls, sort of stacked on top of each other. Um, and I've shown, I've outlined here, there, there are remarkable um, portraits of actual buildings in Florence, some of the major buildings of Florence. And um, you can even see on the right-hand side, the cathedral with its half-built facade and its half-built bell tower. And just behind it is the old cathedral that they were in the process of tearing down around the mid 14th century, for example. And so there's a remarkable kind of realism to this image, even though the image itself um, is um, not necessarily representationally accurate. But what I think is more important um, for my purposes tonight is to sort of zoom out a little bit on this image and to show you the way in which um, it exists as a kind of succession of protective layers. The city is represented as this mass of buildings. And I, and I wanted to um, quote from a 13th century um, political philosopher, a Florentine political philosopher, whose name is Brunetto Latini, who says in his rhetorica that cities are a collection of men, six, sorry, gathered together to live according to reason and justice. And I think what this image is doing is, um, is actually sort of completing that, um, um, uh, uh, that statement to show how a city is both a collection of buildings and a collection of people, both of which are mutually reinforcing and protecting each other. Because as you can see in this image, the citizens of Florence are represented outside the walls as a kind of protective social layer, right, around the physical protection of its, um, of its fortified walls. And if you zoom out to the whole image, which is the one that you saw at the beginning, we see that we have the, the social body protecting the physical um, uh, built environment, and then the divine protection right, of the Virgin Mary in her guise as um, the Madonna della Misericordia, or Mercy, who's um, usually shown in, uh, who, uh, with her cloak embracing a certain community, and here she's hovering above the city, and so there's a kind of a way in which the, both the, the, the political body, the architectural body, and the divine body of the city are represented as these mutually constituting um, forces. And so this is the kind of ideal that Florentines held within their, um, uh, within their sort of collective imagination of the ways in which they related to their city, to the divine protect protection of their city, and to the protection of others around them as, um, um, as an urban community. So I just keep, I wanted to keep that sort of image in mind as I as I go through my lecture tonight, which starts with the digital project that I'm currently working on, which is um, entitled Catasto, because it has to do with a um, a 1427 tax census. This is what we're calling it here, um, in which we're my colleague and I, um, Carmen Caswell, who um, works for Humanities Computing at University of Chicago, we are trying to um, map the social dynamics of Florence in the year 1427 based on this tax census. So let me start my paper from there. So in the spirit of the city as a physical and social phenomenon, insofar as each necessitates the other, I want to introduce the Catastro project um, that, uh, on which Carmen Caswell and I are working together to transform the demographic data stored in a remarkable archive of Florentine legislation from the early 15th century. Our goal is to turn this textual data into a topographical map that will give us both a comprehensive bird's eye view of the Renaissance Florence, not seen before, and the ability, to, the ability to zoom into the individual households that made this city one of the most dynamic artistic, architectural, social, and economic urban centers of early modern Europe. In between these two extremes lie all the networks of relationships that Florentines constructed between themselves through the spaces of their city, and it is the excavation of those networks that we hope to ultimately uncover and to map. The archive in question is a series of tax documents produced in the wake of the protracted military struggle against Milan in the early 1420s when the Florentine government repeatedly imposed forced loans upon its citizens to combat the mounting fiscal crisis caused by the war. The system was based on calculating a predetermined amount to be collected from each of the city's 16 wards and entrusting nine boards of assessors to make an assessment on each household based on an assumed value of that household's wealth. 
But the sums collected were always deeply disappointing. Powerful citizens could always financially protect themselves, reward friends and punish enemies in a system that was in one contemporary's words, like guessing in the dark. Consequently, on May 24th, 1427, the government introduced legislation to completely overhaul the entire tax system, instituting the short-lived but historically monumental catasto, a massive project of fiscal reform that was meant, as was stated in the preamble, to rectify the unhappy condition in which, quote, neither pen nor tongue can describe the number and quality of the citizens whom unfair taxes have stripped of their properties, forced into exile, and reduced to near despair. So rather than simply rationalizing or producing new relations between the state and its citizens on fiscal grounds, the Catasto instituted in legal form the ways in which Florentines already derive their multiple identities by locating themselves, their families, and their, and their properties in space. In fact, two of the major principles that Florentine lawmakers advocated over, over and over was that all forms of property, both real and movable, should be liable to assessment wherever they were found, in the city, country, subject territories, or even outside of Florentine domains. And the exemptions were made exclusively for the houses within which, when, within which one lived and all those dependents who lived there as well. So your entire real estate and, um, and all, your entire wealth was taxed except for the place that you lived in and the stuff that was in that house, including all of the human beings who lived there. These policies had two significant effects on the Renaissance city as we know it. On the one hand, it defined the family as a cohesive unit based on common residency and a distinct entity from its neighbors. On the other, it stimulated investment in one's principal private residence. In 1427, none of the palaces or the magnificent facades that established a family's symbolic and spatial relationship to the city, its streets, squares, and human traffic had been built. But this fiscal and aesthetic transformation of the family palace into a distinct Renaissance architectural typology was the most visible node around which a family established its spatial presence in the city. And it is this defining relationship between the built environment and the social environment that this project takes, seeks to make visible and meaningful. Um, i just showing you here um, uh, what um, preceded the emergence of the Renaissance Palace as a cohesive aesthetic unity, and that was a kind of an interior looking collection or agglomeration of properties um, and kind of private neighborhoods in which larger extended family clans constructed neighborhoods against, um, uh, against their, their neighbors and their enemies, as opposed to a much more um, uh, closer idea to what we would understand as the nuclear family. Our methodological inspiration comes from two major studies of Florence, both of which deployed the catasto in different ways. The first was data-driven and sociological. It was one of the earliest digital data mining projects brought to bear on the Renaissance city and possibly in my uh, entire field. In the 1970s, David Herlihy and Christian Clapey-Joubert combined the most advanced computational technologies available with the methods of the French Annal School of Historical Research, with its emphasis on human experience and applied it to the catasto. The result was a monumental snapshot of the city's social ecology in 1427, generating statistical patterns of wealth, gender relations, birth, and labor, to name a few. The second survey, uh, sorry, the second project was, the archaeolog was archaeological and driven by um, urban renewal in the 19th century. In the wake of the crisis provoked by moving the capital of Italy from Florence to Rome in 1871, Florence confronted the architectural and infrastructural degradation of its urban core with the discourse of 19th century slum clearance and public health. These demolitions around the city's ancient center also erased the topographical vestiges of some of its oldest and wealthiest families. Guido, Guido Carocci, the Royal Inspector of Antiquities, took the opportunity to carry out a survey of the city's architectural past that lay hidden beneath 
the 19th century city, adding in the names of the families and institutions to the properties they owned there. This hand-drawn map that you see here is both a testament to his skill in working between archaeological and documentary sources and an expression of the analog limits of solving the relational puzzle embedded in, in the Catasto formula. Our collaborative venture, therefore, extends Karachi's map to embrace the entire city using the Catasto's locational data to build a digital cartographic map embedded with the spatial demographics of the Renaissance city. Such a map questions the understanding of urban space as a fixed container for organizing society and repurposes a cartographic method where such space is the direct effect of a society's social interactions operating through state legislation, architectural design, and decentralized social networks. Florentines understood their economic, social, and political worlds spatially as a series of interconnected topographies defined by human relationships. Therefore, our interpretive model is based on the way that Florentines themselves express their identity geographically by spatially coding those relationships. Such articulations can be found in the diaristic practices of Florentine merchants. They were, they were acutely aware of the importance of maintaining a written record of, and a cognitive map of their family's ancestral origins and the current architectural geography that defined them as a family in a neighborhood, in a parish, and in an administrative district. And here you can see the 16 administrative districts are Gonfaloni, that were the tax, the, the basis of the taxing system. The, uh, four, either four of them sit within the uh, four quarters of the, um, um, of the city um, itself. As an example of the spatial imagination, consider the, um, consider the diary of Benedetto Dei, which was written around 1473. Like many of his mercantile peers, Benedetto was an inveterate list maker. And it was through such lists that he created a kind of mental scaffolding onto which he could arrange buildings, people, and objects into the various socio-spatial relationships that he understood them to have. He began his diary, for example, by declaring that he was first a Florentine citizen, that he came from the district of Perza or Whip, which was located in the quarter of Santo Spirito. He then begins the first of many rather monotonous, hypnotic, but strangely compelling series of repetitions. The phrase Florentia Bella, Florence the Beautiful, initiates a series of numbers as he counts all manner of Florentine buildings, bridges, and spaces. Florentia Bella, 1,545 years of liberty, five miles around with 80 towers in its walls. Florentia Bella, 406 towns that open and close each morning and evening under its authority. Florentia Bella, 360,000 gold florins collected in taxes for wars, but also for dowries. Florentia Bella, 3,600 palaces outside the city, 108 churches that mark the holy offices, 23 government palaces, and 21 guilds. Florentia Bella, 50 public squares within the city of which he lists about 40. All of these spaces are in turn surrounded by palaces and churches, he writes, merchants and workshops, and filled with Florentines pursuing their leisure. These pursuits, a mix of spectacle and participation, included jousts, dances, and dramas, but also games of throwing and kicking balls, playing dice, betting tables, and spinning tops. This is, a, this is typical of the sequence in which Benedetto, Benedetto's lists are constructed. He counts the squares, names them, then fills the, them with buildings, and then enlivens them with the activities people performed in them. And I'm showing you the red ink because in the manuscript, he actually um, uh, repeats the initial phrase, una via, una via, una via, or uh, Florentia Bella in red ink in his manuscript. At this point, Benedetto zooms uh, in to make a network analysis of the streets and squares of his own neighborhood, constructed on the repetition of the phrase una via, a street. As a Florentine merchant was inclined to do, he reduced the chaos that surrounded him, that profusion of people and goods, spaces and exchanges, to organized quantitative groups. 
He puts names, households, bridges, streets, and squares into spatial relations by the rhythmic repetition of a series of phrases that move from one end of a street to another. Una via, he writes, from the gate of San Frediano to the gate of San Nicolo, full of gentlemen. Una via, from the old bridge, Ponte Vecchio, to the gate of San Piero Gattolino, the Roman gate. Una via, from the Santa Trinita bridge to the column in Via Maggio. Una via from Santa Trinita, the Santa Trinita bridge to the, sorry, Una via from the Caraja bridge to the gate at the lime kilns, the gate towards Rome. Una via from the old bridge to the gate of San Giorgio, which goes to Arcetri, and so on. The reader experiences a crisscrossing itinerary through the network of neighborhood streets. He gives the main east-west then north-south axes, then the routes from bridges through the neighborhood and gives the most um, brief but very illuminating information about the street or gate he names. It is the rhythm of the language or the repetition of terms that helps him to order, that helps to order and build a striking image of the topography. The reader follows Benedetto as he traverses all 27 streets in the neighborhood, accumulating 33,000 arm lengths or braccia, 11 miles of streets that he connects to each adjacent square and church, intimating what activities took place there. Um, and so you can imagine that he's walking and counting and measuring at, through the entire neighborhood to produce this. Una piazza called Santo Spirito, where the wool is stretched and where, where ball games are played. Una piazza of San Felice, where, where the Ridolfi, Caponi, and Lippi reside. And there are churches. Una chiesa of Santo Spirito, the principal church and biggest of the quarter. Una chiesa of Santa Maria del Carmine, where the hours of the church are celebrated both day and night. Okay, sorry. Not too. Make you go through that again. So hang on. So I've lost my. Oh, there you are. Can you tell me when I'm on the little arrow thing? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I apologize. You're going to have to watch this animation again. But what is interesting is the way in which he, um, and this is what I, I teach my, um, my students often, I get them to measure their forefingers and their wingspan and their, um, their hand span and their, um, uh, you know, their height and they're also their gait so that they can also measure the city when they're walking through it and they can do circumferences and they can do distances and things like that. Um, and I think that's precisely what someone like Benedetto Day is um, able to do with his own body. Okay, I think we're out of that. Okay, thank God, okay. All right. So una piazza, una chiesa, una chiesa, un monastero, un ospedale. At first, all these accumulative lists appear as abstractions, a view that separates space from social experience. But on closer inspection, the detail of the text points to a more intimate connection between the author and the spaces he describes. In Santo Spirito, he marks the streets by physical, by physical landmarks, such as bridges, wells, hospitals, city gates, gardens, and squares. However, he also marks them with the name of the households that border these streets. It proves that Benedetto was intimately familiar with both the physical and the social topography of his neighborhood and that he was able to graft one onto the other. He locates houses and families in space, and we know that some of those names bore more significance than others. Some of the houses, Manetti, Caponi, Guicciardini, Sororini, Fantoni, show up later in his text um, in his text, in lists of enemies and friends. And some of those, such as the Capone, show up on both. 
Therefore, this was a charged topography for Benedetto. And even though his technique strives for completeness or comprehensiveness, we can see in the details how certain spaces may be off limits or centers of refuge, depending on who lives there. It's an intensely personal topography that takes account of friendly and hostile places, even as it enlivens those social spaces with bodies and activities, the kind of um, encounters that one randomly makes in cities. Benedetto was taking account, or ragionare, in the Italian phrase, um, of the spaces of his most intimate social life, transforming them into the language of the account book. These are the, um, the, the kind of rhetoric comes from the ways in which he's keeping his own financial records. This gives his neighborhood an enviable rationality into which he could then insert his own idiosyncratic relations. His description moves from measured space through a social topography to the social rituals of a larger civic narrative. And this is a constant um, uh, motion that he goes through. Establishing his multiple identities through um, such a social spatial lens is precisely what the 1427 Catasto formalized as a series of repeated verbal gestures across the entire city as each household took account of their identity as a function of where their properties were located in relation to those of others. So let me show you this little pattern here. The individual declarations of the catastrophe were essentially, and you're seeing one here, um, essentially lists of a similar genre. They look just like the diary. They begin much like a merchant's diary, defining who the declarer was by locating them in space. This one reads, I, Giovanni Torsellino, barrel maker of the District of the Red Lion, make a record below of all my movable goods and real estate, debtors, creditors, and all my obligations so that you may, may be well informed of the truth. Right. Immediately following, he identifies the overlapping spatial relations in which he understood himself in a list of all his properties. Quote, firstly, two houses of which one is suited as a home for me and my family and is situated in the Via del Moro in the parish of San Pancrazio. Then he systematically lists four neighbors or what are called confini to his property. The so-called cadastral grid was, was made up for the most part by a quadripartite system of thresholds. And here you can see the way in which he just lists all of his, I mean, it, and this gives you the, the, the sensation of the diary, right? The repetition of another piece of land, another piece of land, another house, another piece of land, a vineyard, for example. And this is what we're calling the cadastral grid here in the, in the context of the catasto. Um, for, for Giovanni, the first confine or border, and this is the true for most of these tax declarations, is the street or square you live on. The second, in this, in his case was Filippo di Tommaso the apothecary, the third was a small house, the fourth was a widow um, whose name was Antonia, who was the wife of, who was the wife of Niccolò di Jacopo the cheesemonger, who is now known as Nicoletto. So she gives the nickname, uh, gives the nickname as well. But what I'm showing you here is a bit more interesting in terms of the, of the context we're in here with um, Botticelli, the Botticelli show, because we've uh, located Botticelli's father. So Botticelli's father was Mariano di Vanni di Peppi, and he rented his house from Simone di Niccolo di Bruno Manovelli. Um, so, what, I mean, this is what we took the opportunity last week to take a look at this uh, a little closer, Carmen and I, um, and using this as a kind of test case. So this, um, this is the tax return of Botticelli's father, who was a leather tanner and who rented a house from um, Simone, who was a fur tanner. Likely the, co the close occupational relationship led to such a contract. Mariano frustratingly um, disrupts the quadripartite grid by only naming three of his neighbors and lists himself as one of them. This is just, uh, this is just to give you a tiny sense of the kinds of problems we encounter when we, um, with this kind of data. However, we can also cross-reference this property with the tax return of its owner, right? So that both the renter and the owner are making declarations and claiming the same property in different modes. Right? Um, 
Simone, who lists the same street, thankfully, Borgo Ogni Santi, as the first confine, um, the same Cristofano del Teglia, sorry, I don't even know how to pronounce that name, I've never seen that name before, who also owned another property on the other side, which might be also rented by Mariano, maybe that's the case here, with the fourth neighbor being the monastery of, the, of Ogni Santi itself, so the, the large piece of land uh, next to it. Note that Mariano, he lists his renter as a leather sole seller and not a leather tanner. Okay, so this is likely where Botticelli grew up after he was born in 1444 or 1445, right there where the red dot is. And here I am showing you his house on the 1581 Bonsignori map of Florence. And I'll more to say in this map shortly, highlighted in orange along with property, the property description given by his father. So he's telling you a house I rent and live in. That's why I'm not paying taxes on it. Now, um, Carmen has developed, and I can't ex express this to you, she developed a kind of a magical method of digitally vi uh, visualizing the spatial relationships of these um, confini neighbors, which is a real um, abstract um, uh, mess for me to think about. Uh, and in, I'm at a complete loss to explain this. Normally we present this together, but she couldn't be here tonight. So I will skip over that part, but, but um, believe me, she knows exactly what she's doing. And it's partly, it's partly algorithmic, it's partly um, by hand that she's doing it. Um, however, with a combination of algorithms and a very sophisticated spatial thinking, because this is not at all easy what uh, she's doing here, She's developed a system to plot these properties in space. Using this method, we can see that Cristofano um, del Teglia owned the property between Botticelli's house and the monastery, as well as that on the other side of Mariano, claiming to live in both of them. So he's maybe trying to get double tax exemption here. Next to that was one of his relatives, um, same last name, different father, and a much, but much higher in social structure. You see that his um, his epithet is Messer, which means he's either a jurist, so he has a PhD in law, or he's a knight. This place was rented to an as yet unidentified person. We can't find the person who declares this as their rental property yet. Around the corner, lived Giuntino di Guido in a house owned jointly with his two brothers in order to not divide the, 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 the family's patrimony. The two brothers owned and lived in the house next door. And finally, Andrea and his brothers jointly own a house in which he lived and, and so on. That's Andrea and his brothers there. This is the method by which we are slowly plotting the entire city. And it gives us a sense of Botticelli's neighborhood, which was populated by modest artisans, even lower status wool workers, and one rather upper class landlord. So this spatial grid defined by landlords and leaseholders representing domestic, sometimes commercial and institutional structures, sets them because I'm because many monasteries and churches also owned land and rented them out, sets the multiple dimensions of Florentine social life within an unfolding series of relational contiguities that would logically allow one to map the spatial demographics of the whole city. Or to put another way, to fill the map with the social life that Benedetto was so intent upon doing. The highly systematized accounting process of the Catasto relied on the aggregate authorship of thousands of individuals. As such, it is a record of multiple and competing ways in which Florentines imagined the world around them. But as Herli he and Clapis Joubert point out, no Florentine, not even the small army of notaries who were preparing and assessing the declarations, would have had the kind of bird's eye view of the Catasto's data that we um, have using quantitative methods of analysis. However, they did, like Benedetto, exhibit a keen sense of how the data was a factor of one's position within Florentine society, socially and spatially, which often determined the sliding hierarchy and nomenclature of streets. And this is what we find fascinating too. Um, streets, institutions, and people in which depending on one's perspective, a thing might be named for its founder, its donor, its owner, its manager, 
or current resident. In other words, depending on who you are in Florence, you understand the property's relationship to you in terms of maybe who lives there, who the landlord might be who doesn't live there, or who the donor of this was to a, to a charitable organization, depending on how you understood your spatial and social relationships. And this is both, of course, frustrating, but extremely fascinating um, as a historical point. And those intimate and individual views of social spatial relations are what we as analysts, right, as 20th century, 21st century historians do not have. We get the bird's eye view, they have a street level view, but I think by, by deploying these digital technologies to map the social demographics of the Catasto, we can insert ourselves into the logic of the individual and the bird's eye view of the city. At least that's the hope for 1427. We can learn, therefore, about the relationship between buildings and people, between space and history. Our desire is to rebuild the geography as much as it may be possible of the 15th century city without always having to recourse to what many studies of Renaissance Florence have relied on somewhat anachronistically, um, and this would be the remarkable cartographic achievement known as the Bonsignori map produced in the late 16th century and whose fidelity to the placement of many known monuments is complemented by its merciless attention to detail. As any work of art, or even I would argue the most prosaic documentary source, the one signori map is an experiment in representation of techniques of geographic triangulation, but also of graphic self-presentation. Its accuracy, which we both take for granted and fitfully distrust, was not its ultimate goal, but an important function within its, within its representational strategy. It initiates a spatial history for which it is the founding moment of a city imagined as a network of conduits rather than an aggregate view of buildings that you see here from the map that Leah showed you, which is in the show in, in, um, in Minneapolis. Images like the so-called chain map here, sorry, for example, register the transition from more direct, direct bodily and partial uh, and the direct bodily and the partial apprehension of cityscapes, right, to an ethnographic view of the city as a whole from above. The Bonsignori map maintains these two views, street networks and building elevations, which is why I think it's such an interesting um, document, um, in a delicate balance so that the city streets are clearly visible as a network stitched together by the possible itineraries through them, and the profile of buildings remain legible in their function as human cohabitations. However, one of the dominant features of the map is its relative completeness. Absent are any explicit uh, indications of the city's possible structural future or past, construction sites, demolitions, destroyed buildings, or decaying infrastructure. There are some, there's some evidence of underdevelopment around the edges, but overwhelmingly each block is self-contained. Gardens, orchards, vineyards, and fields are circumscribed by walls that subdivide unbuilt sectors of the city, still expanding out to fill its early 14th century aspirations. As all of us know, I'm sure cities, especially ones as dynamic as Renaissance Florence, are by definition in constant flux, both socially and structurally. They are in constant need of repair and under constant pressure for renewal. As a result, the Bonsignori map is both a snapshot of a particular moment and an urban ideal of order and efficiency. This is not to criticize the map for dissembling the truth, but it is but it, because it is constructing its own particular reality, but a reality more than a century after the Catasto. Our project, on the other hand, uses the data of the 1427 Catasto as a means of building a demographic and topographic map that brings the text into alignment with the spatial armature it brings into being, that is embedded in the aggregate of each single declaration, which brings me back to Carocci. Caracci was able to take advantage of the 19th century urban renewal project, even as he also fought against it, using the demolitions to find the footprint of the Renaissance city, while using the Catasto to populate it with the families who lived there. This was no small feat, since cross-referencing neighboring property holders quickly becomes an extremely complex geometric um, conundrum. But Caracci's map is actually two maps, rendered as separate layers in a kind of planimetric palimpsest. The building lines of his disappearing city are rendered in black ink, 
which is overlaid onto the excavated footprint of the 15th century city in red. This resulting overlay is very difficult to read, as you can see, but by first orienting his map so that north is at the top, then digitally tracing the lines, we can see these overlapping and distinct cartographic images more clearly and the two maps merge into the dark purple, while the 19th century building, um, buildings of the gray lines indicate the numerous streets that had disappeared by the 19th century. The pink that shows um, the 15th century building lines emerge from the regularized 19th century city. We can then remove Karachi's map extract the 15th century city plan as it was reconstructed by Karachi, and then fill it with the names of families who declared their properties in 1427, and the streets and squares named in the Catastro's declarations. Finally, we can then embed this map within the geography of the whole city in order to continue building the entire topography of the 1427 city. Karachi's monumental preservation work can now be completed and enhanced by the computational power of digital technologies brought to bear on the Florentine Confini system. So what I've presented so far is an ideal image of the medieval city represented to itself and our technical analysis of the city as a socio-spatial phenomenon, the Misericordia fresco and the, the Catasto um, made visual. Now I'd like to use two stories to show how such an ideal and such spatial relations played out in the literary imagination to offer a sense of how meaningful such ideals and relations were at the street level. The first story centers on a hammer, the second on a rock, and both revolve around the sound of the city. So let me start with the hammer. In a story by Franco Sacchetti, the poet Dante Alighieri is asked by a young knight of the Adimari family to make a public endorsement on his behalf with the city's executor in order to get him out of paying a fine that he had occur, incurred. Dante agrees to put a good word in, uh, uh, in with him and sets off to the palace. But something strange happens along the way. Not far from the Badia, the Benedictine monastery, he hears something that he does not like at all. Inside a workshop, a blacksmith was merrily singing Dante's divine comedy using its rhythmic cadences to regulate the striking of his hammer. But he wasn't singing it very well. He was mixing up the verses and generally hacking its syntax to pieces, so, so much so that Dante felt it a personal injury. Without saying a word, he enters the shop and starts throwing the blacksmith's tools one by one onto the street. First his hammer, then his tongs, and then his scales. When the blacksmith protests, Dante retorts, if you don't want me to break your tools, don't ruin mine. And how, the blacksmith wondered, could he have ever broken this mad stranger's tools, to which Dante replies, you are singing my poem, but you are not reciting it the way I wrote it. I have no other trade, and you were destroying it for me. Stupefied, the blacksmith gathers together his belongings in silence and returns to work, careful to sing about only Tristan and Lancelot and leave Dante alone. Dante, for his part, was truly rankled by the incident and by the time he arrived at the executor's palace, he was in a particularly foul mood. As he walked through the streets, he began to think about how the knight would ride through, the, this is the Adimari knight, would ride through the sea on, on a horse, his legs so widely extended that those passing him on the street were forced to turn back. And with their backs against the wall to suffer the indignity of polishing the tips of his shoes as he rode past. As a result, instead of making a statement supporting his friend, he denounced him for the crime of, and this is what's hilarious, riding widely or cavalcari largo. The executor agreed that this was a grave crime and deeds, and, and so instead of having the fine against Arimari dismissed, Dante succeeded in having it doubled. A rock. In the 1568 edition of the lives of the most excellent painters, sculptors, and architects, Giorgio Vasari recounts an episode from the life of the 15th century painter, our good friend Sandro Botticelli, in which the, a cloth weaver moves in next door to the artist. And here he is here. 
and they sell portrait from the painting that is on display in Minneapolis. The weaver proceeds to assemble no less than eight looms in his home. And when they were set in motion, they created such a tremendous clamor that not only deafened poor Sandro with the noise of the treadles and the movement of the frames, but shook his whole house, the walls of which were no stronger than they should be, so that what with one thing and the other, he could not work even uh, or even stay at home. Botticelli's repeated entreaties for him to stop fell on deaf ears because the weaver asserted that, quote, he both would and could do what he pleased in his own house. Having failed to persuade his neighbor with reason, Botticelli concocted a cunning plan. He hoisted an enormous rock onto the roof of his house and balanced it on the partition wall that separated him from his noisy neighbor. The wall was higher and less stable than his neighbor's so that the rock threatened to crash through his neighbor's roof and destroy his home at the slightest tremor of the wall. To the terrified weaver's subsequent protest, Botticelli responded by quoting his own words, claiming that he too could and would do whatever he pleased in his own house. The story ends with Botticelli having successfully compelled the weaver to, quote, come to a reasonable agreement and to be a good neighbor to Sandro. In both these stories, which are fictionalized accounts of real life Florentines, the central theme around which the narrative, uh, narratives hinge is the relative power to communicate with the city to silence the voices and sounds made by others and to control crucial elements of the city's soundscape and streetscape along with the, uh, the meaning such spaces contained. Therefore, a closer look at what was at stake for Florentines in confronting the acoustic and spatial experiences they encountered to listen to and to look at what they say, uh, what they say about the urban socio-spatial relations in which they were produced, the audiences to which they were addressed, and the different but related strategies of representation that they put into play is in order. Sorry, that was a long sentence. Okay. By the time Dante, sorry, by the time Dante, um, the author was transformed by Franco Sacchetti into Dante the character around the 1390s, the civic soundscape had been fully integrated itself, had, had fully integrated itself into the gaps in between the ecclesiastical ringing from both the cathedral and the Benedictine monastery of the Badia, carefully orchestrating ancient and new sounds. Florentines therefore were very acute listeners and Sacchetti picked up on the subtle sensitivity of Dante's ear. By filtering Dante's poem through the discordant voice of a tone-deaf blacksmith, he contrasted the sonorous sound of the city's audible past with the horrifying linguistic mutilations that resulted from the unrestricted circulation of stories in the oral culture of the pre-modern city. At first glance, Dante's, uh, Dante's chance at oral encounter with the blacksmith appears to bear no relation to the framing narrative of the story, nor provide the basis for Dante's sudden change of mind about the wayward night. But as he moved through the city, hearing those awful sounds, it caused him to think about space. And this recognition put him in a very awkward position. At the turn of the 15th century, Sacchetti was using Dante and his poetry as a means of exploring the complex class relationships in which wealthy non-elite guildsmen like Dante a fluid class of merchants, bankers, and judges tried to distinguish themselves from both the violent upper-class clans and from the less affluent and more numerous lower guildsmen, like blacksmiths, who were legally enfranchised but did not participate directly in the large textile and international financial sectors that drove the Florentine economy. Comparing his own metier to that of a metal worker, Dante protests against the debasement of one type of work, by its acoustic contamination with another. The text is explicit about how the blacksmith was singing the poem just like a street performer. He was reciting verses he had heard in the Piazza San Martino by professional singers who would, re, who would create a shared community, community by continually reinterpreting stories as they performed them, experimenting with additions and variations, improvisations, and inserting digressions as they adapted to different audiences. So he likely was listening to a corrupted version um, orally of Dante's Commedia, and that's what he was singing because he might not have been able to read it or get himself a copy of it. But this was tearing Dante apart 
and the personal injury he uh, felt was caused by the loss of control over the medium through which he established his identity as a writer and a citizen. Sacchetti was posing the question about how much control an author ought to have over the consumption and distribution of his work in space and whether the reading and listening public had a right to adapt such texts to their social needs. If this poem was his, was his tool, the problem for Dante was that his medium was the very vernacular language his compatriots were using to mangle it. The public realm in which such stories circulated favored the integrity of the community over the integrity of the text. So if he could not control the content of his narrative, then perhaps he could claim ownership over its style. It was the manner in which the blacksmith sang it, after all, that so hurt Dante, who in real life condemned the hideous speech of his fellow Tuscans, mired as it was in their own stupidity. And the attentive reader would have also enjoyed the multiple layers of irony that resulted from the fact that Sacchetti was rewriting a story recounted by the ancient writer Diogenes Laertius, in which Philo Philoxenus hears a bunch of brickmakers singing his melodies out of tune and tramples on their bricks. Not to mention the fact that Sacchetti's own writing style was far closer to the very colloquial idiom of the Florentine street than Dante, both fictional character and historical writer, was attacking as awful in the first place. If the Florentine political class officially included the likes of our blacksmith, then Sacchetti's story also puts into play how an increasingly erudite middle class represented by Dante tried to distance and distinguish itself from both the artisanal class of semi-literate workers represented by the blacksmith and the spatial arrogance of upper class men represented by the Arimari knight. Dante did not denounce the blacksmith to the executor for the crime of singing badly. Instead, the episode made him aware immediately of the knight's relationship to space. Immediately after confronting the singing blacksmith, he begins to think about the nature of the urban spaces he is walking through, to whom they belonged, how they should be addressed, and the proper means of moving through them. Public streets and squares and palaces represented the universalizing ideology of the merchant republic, while it was the concrete infrastructure that facilitated economic exchange. They were not the private property of the violent upper classes. In fact, arrogant knights such as his widely riding friend disrupted the free movement along public streets that, govern that the government was supposed to guarantee. It was the property of the commune he was usurping, Dante tells the executor, by riding in such a way. I believe, he goes on to say, quote, that to usurp that which belongs to the commune is a very serious crime. For Sacchetti's Dante, usurping public space was akin to usurping political power, of wrapping oneself up in public space as if it were a private mantle. This was far more annoying than the sound of badly singing blacksmiths. And he could hate the blacksmith, certainly, but he could not challenge his right to invade public space with the obnoxious sound of his voice. The solution to this problem had to be meted out with cunning and skill, not with legal punishments. He had to educate the smith, however crudely, and convince him with reason or analogy to change his misguided ways, which brings me finally to the rock. The starry story about Botticelli, which appears in um, the second edition of The Lives, is likely an invention. Its noisy theme focuses on the borders between public and private space, while teaching the wool weaver a lesson about the intimate relationship between sound, architecture, and community. Botticelli's neighbor mistakenly believed that the walls of his home represented the absolute sensorial boundary between his own private domestic space and the rest of the city. In the tight-knit housing agglomeration of Florence, Botticelli's solution demonstrated by example how sound, though invisible and immaterial, had a real physical effect on the built environment, making walls vibrate and penetrating spatial boundaries in direct opposition to Dante's memory of the bell of the Badia. In an, um, as an artist, Botticelli's expertise rested on making visible the complex interplay between social relations, literary narratives, biblical truths, and human desires. In this story, he is also depicted as having a very subtle understanding of how those relations may have actually played out in the urban context. The precariously perched rock reminded the weaver of the public community to which he belonged. 
a community whose spatial demarcations were no less complex and interpenetrating as the artistic compositions of Botticelli's paintings. Walls were never absolute borders since they always belonged to at least two different spaces at the same, same time. Two different constituencies are two modes of living that could vibrate in resonance or clash in discord. This forces us to rethink the way in which we analyze the spatial organization of the, of the historical city in which inhabitants were constantly fiddling with its details, not unlike the Smiths fiddling with Dante to make it conform to their needs. Vasari was also making a distinction between two types of material production that echoes the questions Sakati posed about the value of one's labor between the artisan and the artist, between the manufacture of cloth and the creation of art. The former was characterized by the clanking and banging of industrial machines that denied the artist the silent solitude needed for creative reflection. Vasari's explicit desire in his lives to situate the three major branches of art, painting, sculpture, and architecture within the domain of intellectual production is implicitly reinforced by this humorous anecdote, the weaving of cloth, once the engine that drove the, city, uh, the city's economy was now represented as an unwanted sonic obstacle to artistic creativity. The increasing intellectualization of what we now call the fine arts set the refined head and hand of the artist against the technical production of luxury goods that would be relegated to the subordinate category of decorative arts. And by way of conclusion, what this story implies about architecture in particular is the role it plays in as the hinge around which social relations were played out, where communities separated by walls and bound together by sounds that literally animated walls by making them vibrate. In fact, it was the weakness of the wall that allowed Botticelli's rock to make visible the destructive potential of certain sounds and positive relationships between silence and mental labor. At the micro level of day-to-day -day life, Sacchetti could dramatize how Dante learned about the interlaced social and political relations he shared with those above and below him, relations so tangled up with each other that historians have trouble constructing solid boundaries between them. As Botticelli's painfully thin wall reminds us, architectural barriers were as porous as the social boundaries they were erected to maintain and to reinforce. Florentines knew this much better than we often do, and were constantly listening to the noises their city made, constantly watching how others inhabited urban spaces, using them as signposts for navigating, willingly or not, through the multiple, multiple fluid overlapping and conflicted topographies with, uh, with which their city confronted them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Neil, for that beautiful talk, really contextualizing Botticelli um, and essentially like mapping Florence without the maps, because it, it seemed to me like there are no maps. I, I'll start out actually, I'll just take the lead and ask a question. We don't have a whole lot of time, but we can take questions from the audience and from the Zoom participants. But I'll just start by asking, are there maps of Florence before Bonsignori? Or are we really that reliant on, on that map for mapping Florence? Or I think um, it depends, I guess, what you would call a map. Um, I think um, it's probably the first, what we might understand as modern cartographic map based on projection systems that were rediscovered in the early, late 14th, early 15th century, right? With the reintroduction of Ptolemy into the Western uh, intellectual tradition. If, if the chain map, which is a bird's eye view and the Misericordia map um, uh, image are considered maps, then yes, but they are less usable in terms of how we understand maps. So the, the Bonsignore has become the default for several centuries of Florentine research cartographically. That's what's so amazing that you're using a Carocci and all these documents to essentially create a map that doesn't exist, yeah. Okay, so questions from the audience? Questions from Zoom? Okay, Curtis? I think we have just one. Okay.
Oh, you mean because they, because they are, um, you're asking about the people at the beginning when I showed those people are surrounding their own city and you are imagining uh, people actually at the walls of the city, right? Who are the Oh, I mean, I think there's a certain sort of, um, do, do those people um, that surround the, the, the walls represent accurate representation of the, of the people of Florence at the time? I can only say that it's, a, I mean, for me, it's a kind of ideal. They're all in the act of prayer, right? They are many times a scale bigger than the city itself. And so it depends on how you mean accuracy, right? I mean, in terms of what they're wearing, probably. I don't Yeah. Yeah, we, I think it is an idealized image of a city that wants to represent itself as a collective that is non-monarchical, right? Non-noble, right? That is sort of middle class and mercantile and certainly not lower class and the rabble. But it's interesting that you mentioned around, and this is something I haven't thought of, so thank you for pointing that out, that um, any at any given day around the city's walls of Florence, there were poor, right? Supplicating and begging um, and there were charitable organizations often situated just outside the walls taking care of them as a way of perhaps keeping them outside the sacred interior of the city, but still maintaining that kind of charitable relationship to the poor. So there, I mean, a Florentine would have probably made that connection as well. Yeah, we can take one more question from the audience and I'm gonna bring the mic to you so the Zoom participants can hear it. Thank you so much, Neil. Could you say something briefly about the software or digital applications you're using to visualize your data geospatially? Thank you so much. I thought I would get away without a question like that, Karen, but thank you anyway. And this, because this is really um, um, Carmen's domain. But Carmen has been able to develop scripts in which she's able to take, um, um, cause we've been, we've been, um, um, putting this data, so the data is basically everything referred to, the declaration, the person's name, their family name, um, their occupation, their, um, their father, their mother, their brother, their daughters, it's all family relationships, um, relationships to other properties, relationships to streets. In this database, all those things are linked. So anything that anyone says they're, they're connected to, Right, that database under, uh, understands those relationships. And so when you query that, you can find out, for example, I, I asked Harmon to do this, everyone who, who, who um, declared themselves to be a, a painter in the city in the tax declaration. And so we had a list, you immediately get a list of names, or you can, anyone who's living in a particular area and a particular occupation. So this is um, a custom built database from the University of Chicago called Ochre that was originally constructed for archeological research, which has, as I'm sure you realize, incredibly fragmentary data. So it's to get it's in order to get rid of relational tables and Excel spreadsheets, which are filled with white empty spaces when you have this kind of um, partial data, so that each object has its own clearly defined entity or existence in relationships to other objects and concepts. And so the database understands those relationships between families, generations, grandfathers, that kind of thing, and spaces. And, um, and so that generates um, a series of relationships that then Carmen can write a script for that then can, can place a property um, at the center of a series of neighbors and connected to streets and also connected to other declarations as well. And then she's able to tease out of those connections. You mentioned those, those cloud things that you can often get between when you do network analysis and you get a big cloud of dots connected with, um, um, with lines to other dots and some dots are bigger and some lines are thicker. You get many versions of those and then we, she hand, she's able to hand plot them next to each other. And it just so happened in that little visualization I did um, that there were exactly the number of residential households in the Bon Signore map that, co that um, um, coordinated with the amount, the number of houses next to that monastery. And that was sort of um, um, unnerving in a way because it means that there might be an accuracy to that map that we have not yet understood. Because it, it's, I mean, one has always assumed perhaps that the stuff in between the monumental buildings in that map were just infill and had a regular vernacular architecture. And so, and then there's, and ultimately we get, you get to the GIS where you're actually locating them in digital geographic 
terms so that you can then um, uh, ultimately maybe have a web version of this that then contains and can open up all this information, right, in individual households. Just one, one more. Okay. Last one. Yeah, we're just going to keep going. How much does your work uh, uh, refer to or reflect on what we would consider modern zoning practices? You know, when you were talking about sounds and, and uh, the different elements that go on in the city, I think of when I learned about zoning in Houston, you know, that has no, originally had no zoning. Um, I think of, uh, you know, Florence and how, you know, do you take that into consideration in your demographics? Thank you. you. You mean um, um, zone sort of defining the noise level and that, that kind of? Yeah, yeah, no, it's absolutely fascinating. That's actually one of the projects that I have been working um, on, or one of the things I've been thinking about. The, the regulation of bell ringing was meticulously um, regulated because it, it, it's something that could generate into complete chaos and confusion very quickly because there are so many sounds happening and they need to be happening at the right time, the right places, and, and to get the right messages out because it's a very, it's a very pretty blunt kind of mass communication system. So that was heavily regulated. I mean, speech is regulated too, I mean, it, but it depends on um, how much, how effective the government could be in enforcing that. You're not allowed to talk badly about the government, for example. That's something we're all used to in certain you know, jurisdictions, for example, because you can't criticize authority, for example. Um, and the, um, but, uh, so, but how do you stop the kind of gossip and secrets that are told out in urban space and that kind of thing? And so there are, um, and so especially say during feast days when you have a lot of singing, masses and bell ringing and things happening throughout the city, and you have processions and people moving through, it's a very, very complicated I think, system of, uh, of acoustic expression that also was heavily regulated um, as well. But in terms of zoning, for example, there's no idea of zoning um, uh, in terms of sound because they're relying primarily on Roman law and Roman law has nothing to say about sound except that um, students in universities can't be so noisy that they disrupt the study of their professors. So it's the, I think the only, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the only um, um, reference to sound, but um, so it, there was um, there was not zoning, but so much as um, control over noxious smells that you weren't allowed to um, have your noxious smells of your property filter over into the next property. That was a actually um, a crime. How you dealt with that, or how the one the law dealt with that, I'm not exactly clear. But that could also possibly be part of a legal um, way you could control or regulate sound by maintaining its sort of in, uh, maintaining its jurisdiction within certain spaces, if possible. So just um, connecting to your um, comment about smell, one of our questions from Zoom is about smellscapes. And so we could just end with the smell question. Are, is anybody working on smellscapes in Florence from the period? Um, I don't know, but there is, there is a very large European Research Council project that I think is based in Amsterdam going on right now on pre-modern smells. That they are that they are there's a certain aspect in which they're reconstructing them chemically. So there is a there's a there's a huge movement on this, yes, for sure. Wonderful, Neil. We'll have to bring someone in from that group. Um, okay, well, thanks, Neil, again. It was wonderful having you.